Hey, it's Kay, and this is Skittles, Transcriber. Today we're going to talk about history. Now, when I say history, I don't just mean things that happened in the past. I mean history as a practice. The work of uncovering and deciphering the past, which, to be clear, is always an incomplete and ongoing process. That might strike some people as frustrating, but I find it exciting. The constant process of criticism and reconsideration affords us our best chance at reconstructing and understanding the past. Never perfectly, but well. Let's take a look at two games about history as a practice, so I can show you why that is and why you should care. I'm basically going to be making an argument for learning here, so it's appropriate that this video is sponsored by Brilliant. Do you want to boost your math, data, and computer science skills? Do you like concise, bite-sized lessons? Do you like to know things? Buddy, Bambino, let's talk about Brilliant.org. Brilliant is an online learning platform that uses interactive lessons to help you master the key concepts behind today's technology. New lessons are added every month because there's always more to learn. Now, me, if I want to learn something, I need to do it. With Brilliant, that's exactly what you'll do. Brilliant doesn't just give you information, it builds your intuition to solve problems for yourself. It lets you get hands-on to develop new skills. Learn to create programs with drag-and-drop coding. Interact with charts and graphs. Interactive learning has been shown to be six times more effective than passive learning, like watching lectures. So get your grubby little mitts on that knowledge. To try Brilliant out for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash knskittles, or click on the link in the description. And the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. That's a deal you can't say no to, if you know what's good for you. Back to the video. The Forgotten City started its life as one of my favorite Skyrim mods before the small team of developers turned it into a standalone game. You play as a modern person who has found themselves in an underground ancient Roman city that seems to be stuck in a time loop. The city is governed by the Golden Rule. If anyone commits murder, steals, or otherwise harms anyone else, everybody in the city dies. However, you are able to enter a portal when this massacre begins and restart the day with all your memories of previous loops intact, as well as any objects on your person, making you uniquely equipped to break the city out of this loop. Doing so requires uncovering some important secrets about the city, but before we can discuss those, it's useful to counterpose this game with a popular idea that is best represented with this graph here. Have you seen this before? If you were around places like Reddit when the online New Atheist movement was in its heyday, you probably came across it. The assertion being made by this image is pretty simple. There is a slow but steady increase in scientific advancement up until the fall of the Roman Empire and the beginning of the Christian Dark Ages in which there was an active decline and stagnation in scientific advancement, which I suppose we must imagine is represented by universally recognized science points. Until the Renaissance and Enlightenment comes and saves us all from our ignorance and advancement takes off. The graph speculates that if not for the Dark Ages, we would have followed this imagined trajectory and be a far more scientifically advanced civilization today. So, this is impressively stupid. Let's ignore the preposterous notion that you can just measure general scientific advancement on a linear line like this. The premise being communicated here is that there wasn't scientific advancement during the Middle Ages. This is just not true. 
The Middle Ages saw enormous scientific and cultural development. During this period, the first universities would be founded in Europe, and scholars would develop upon ideas and research that the Greeks and Romans started. Meanwhile, in the Islamic world, they were making even greater strides in the sciences, founding their first universities even earlier. My man Al-Khwarizmi invented algebra in the 9th century. There were also massive developments in surgery and optics, to name a few. China invented the compass and gunpowder, and honestly, we could be here all day. Massively important inventions can be found throughout these so-called Dark Ages. These kinds of historical narratives ignore everyone outside of Europe, but it's worth noting again that they are also false within Europe itself. The idea of the Dark Ages was a story some scholars started telling when, during the Renaissance, there was renewed interest in antiquity and an effort to connect themselves to that revered lineage, increasingly in opposition to the power of the Church. But that connection was never severed. The titular Forgotten City is far more than the Roman streets you begin the game exploring. In fact, explore enough and you will find yourself in a cave, having a literal Socratic dialogue with a philosopher, who stresses to you that the wise man knows he knows nothing. After this extremely subtle interaction, you're free to enter a tunnel that reveals that the Roman city had literally been built on top of a Greek city. Delve further and you'll find that the Greek city was built on top of an Egyptian city. Go deeper yet and that Egyptian city was built on top of a Sumerian city. These past societies form the literal foundations of the societies that follow them. So too did the societies dismissed by this nonsense graph as backwards and unenlightened build themselves on the foundations of the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans. Hell, the big dip here coincides with the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. The Eastern Roman Empire would go on for centuries as the Byzantine Empire, which contributed complex codified legal systems as well as numerous scientific inventions, including hydraulics, kind of important. Where the fuck are their science points, huh? By showing us that these civilizations are literally building upon each other's work, the Forgotten City is asserting that the history of these great civilizations is not the history of discrete eras, where we got a fleeting break from the barbarian hordes, but a continuum that saw subsequent powers rise and decline and even cooperate with each other. Because the lines here, these are wrong. The ancient Egyptian, Greek, and Roman civilizations actually existed at the same time. A more accurate, though still somewhat debatable timeline, looks like this. These civilizations were aware of each other. They traded, fought, exchanged ideas. Alexander the Great brought Egypt under Greek control in 332 BC. Some consider this to be the end of ancient Egypt, but I would argue this created a new Greco-Egyptian version of ancient Egypt distinct from Greece. That continued for hundreds of years, until Rome definitively absorbed Egypt and Greece in 31 BC after the Battle of Actium. But even then, there was an integration period. I won't get into it here, but there's also an argument that something called Mycenaean Greece, which started way back here, constitutes the actual beginning of ancient Greece. Again, a lot of these dates are very fuzzy, but at minimum, we have many centuries of coexistence. Not these distinct beginnings and endings that you see here. The Greek historian Herodotus, considered the father of history as a practice, went to Egypt. He had no illusions about the interconnected nature of Greek and Egyptian culture, going so far as to explicitly identify that the Greeks got their gods from Egypt. This is not some modern take on how these societies developed that we could only come up with thanks to thousands of years of hindsight. This is something people were fully aware of at the time, because people in the past were not stupid. That is perhaps the mission statement of our next game.
If The Forgotten City is a game about how we think about history, Pentiment is a game about historical actors themselves and how they, in a way, look back at us. In Pentiment, you play as Andreas, an artist working as an apprentice, illuminating manuscripts at an abbey outside a small Bavarian town in 1518 when you are suddenly thrust into the role of investigating a murder. It's a really beautifully written game by the same lead dev behind New Vegas. I can't recommend it highly enough. Now, the game being set in the early 16th century puts us firmly in the Renaissance, the period that this wonderful graph figures human society slowly starts developing again. You might expect the Abbey to represent a reactionary force against a changing world that is trying to claw its way out of the Dark Ages. But Pentiment resists that simplistic framing, and the monks and nuns at the Abbey are some of the most thoughtful people you meet in this game. So I'm picking on this graph, but if it's not obvious, this is about more than one dumb meme. This is about several very popular and very wrong ideas about history that this meme represents. One that is perhaps less obvious is about the linear progress of society. The so-called Dark Ages here are used to represent an unnatural break in the supposed default trajectory of human society, which is steady, unbroken, forward advancement. This is an idea that is extremely common today. You've probably heard and might believe yourself that we live in the best time in human history so far in terms of quality of life. Now, in a lot of ways, this is true. Life expectancy has never been higher. Uh, well, that was true one generation ago. People my age are actually the first who are projected to not live as long as their parents. Arguably, the people who grew up in the mid-late 20th century are the ones who actually experienced that peak in living conditions. Now, I'm not some primitivist. Obviously, modern medicine, knowledge about nutrition, these are all tremendous things that extend our lives, but there's also things that are worse today. Because real life is not this easy chart where as time goes on, we simply accumulate more progress points and things get better across the board. Pre-industrial agrarian workers did not work as much as we do, and they had more leisure time. They also had stronger communities, and even accounting for the fact that such diagnoses wouldn't have really existed, it is commonly believed that they had less depression. This is attributed to a lot of factors, but those two things I just listed are a pretty big part of it. In the first half of the 18th century, the new industrial working class lived much worse lives than rural workers. They ate adulterated food, were exposed to unbelievable pollution, and the life expectancy in many industrial centers tanked, sometimes as low as the mid-20s. That is not linear, uncomplicated progress. 60 years ago, someone who has done most of the jobs I've done would have been able to buy a house by now. Me? <laughs> No. This oversimplified vision of history as linear progress feeds into the idea that people in the past were backwards and stupid. That is the idea that I think Pentiment is most concerned with challenging. Many of the people you meet as Andreas are concerned with how the events they're experiencing and their roles in those events will be looked back on by history. With Pedro, an older monk who works on manuscripts alongside you, explicitly asking that very question. The final act of the game revolves around the creation of a mural depicting the founding of the town and the events of the game itself. You are literally tasked with creating history. You have multiple options, all of which have some truth to them. And what you choose to record, what you choose to commemorate in a mural that will be used as a historical source by future scholars, that becomes the story of the town. And what you don't include risks being lost, or at least being seen as a far less important footnote. Deciding what to include in the mural proved to be some of the hardest calls I've ever had to make in a game. And more than that, there are different factions with their own motivations who are trying to pressure you to include or exclude different things. The people of this town are not passive, ignorant beings. They are intelligent, motivated, historical subjects. And their decisions impact the evidence that we, here in the future, actually have access to. 
One of my favorite examples of this is a conversation you have with Sister Illuminata earlier in the game. If you choose to, you can help her collect several books that have not been returned to the Abbey Library, and she will discuss each of them with you. She'll talk about how literature is written primarily from a male perspective, for male readers. She's keenly aware of how women are treated and excluded from certain segments of society. Histories of feminism sometimes operate under an unspoken assumption that before the advent of the suffragettes, that women were basically content or adequately socially repressed enough to not have strong views on the position of women in society. They are depicted as passive, ignorant beings. People that history simply happens to. But if you think about it for a second, that's kind of a silly thing to think, isn't it? This wasn't just a subtle cultural oppression. The inferior status of women was codified into law around property ownership, employment, most things. Of course they would be aware of it. But there's something so jarring about seeing it from a 16th century nun that it forces you to reckon with the overly simplistic way we often think about historical people. The final confrontations in both these games make even firmer statements about historical revisionism, however. Around the middle point of the Forgotten City, when you're discovering the cities built on top of each other, you'll encounter an Egyptian resident of the city who will try to prevent you from revealing that Egypt was not the first civilization with the first gods, and that they too derived many of their ideas from the Sumerians. The final confrontation of Pentiment reveals that the murders you've been investigating throughout the game were all part of a concerted effort to conceal the Roman origins of the saints the townspeople worshipped. In both of these situations, people are trying to destroy historical evidence which unseats the primacy of their civilization, their values. Something that history is absolutely littered with, and I wish I could say we knew for sure how often people were successful at this. While the finale of Pentiment perfectly brings together the game's central argument that people in the past were active, intelligent historical agents with their own motives by presenting us with someone attempting to control what historians will remember about them, the finale of The Forgotten City sets its sights on historians themselves. Let's talk about Pluto. Pluto, or Hades, or Osiris, or Nergal, the god of the underworld, is testing humanity, plucking people out of the world and putting them in his confined, surveilled city to see if a human city can go one year without committing a sin, breaking the golden rule. None ever have, and when they fail, he kills everyone and starts again. He chastises humans for building on top of each other and erasing their own past. But he is literally erasing the past. He is destroying communities and leaving only gold statues, monuments to his power. And so people remember his power. They remember the golden rule, but they lose the knowledge of those who came before them. Pluto is the one viewing historical actors as primitive. Pluto is the one disconnecting them from their own history. And then he blames it on them. Despite, as we already covered, these civilizations in real life being very aware of how they were connected. Remember our good pal Herodotus. Pluto is doing what we do when we treat history like this. He is extracting these people from their historical context and then making them out to be lesser beings for not learning from their own history, when in reality, they did. He just created an artificial image of those societies in which he assumes that they couldn't and draws conclusions from there. Pluto's character reads like a hit piece the devs have created for everything that frustrates them about pop historians. So, why should you care about any of this? Is the point of engaging with history this way just to show off how big your brain is? Well, this matters because our society doesn't especially respect the social sciences. STEM is considered real, while most other fields are branded with this kind of illegitimacy, like historians are just a bunch of people making things up for fun. 
The serious research and scrutiny that goes into this work is ignored, in no small part because the work historians do is often not as profitable as the work that, say, engineers do. We hardly make any drones. Therefore, people feel emboldened to make claims about history without having really done any research of their own. You probably know several weird guys who will tell you all about World War II, and their study on the topic probably doesn't go beyond playing Hearts of Iron 4 and maybe a methodologically dubious podcast, if you're lucky. Now, I'm not saying you need to have a degree in history to talk about it. I do not think universities can or should have the final say on what constitutes legitimate knowledge. But I think we need to cultivate an expectation in ourselves and each other to do a certain amount of research before spouting off on a topic. If you wouldn't just drop a cold hard reckon off the top of your head about chemistry based on half-remembered second-hand knowledge, maybe you shouldn't do it about history. History is complicated and constantly changing. A lot of the incorrect ideas about historical events in popular culture can be traced back to ideas that were considered legitimate decades or even centuries ago. And while the nerd-ass academics figured out they were wrong and corrected it, eventually, that correction may not have made its way into common knowledge, while the mistake lingered. See, for example, the notion of the Dark Ages. You'll struggle to find many medieval historians today who won't tell you that the Dark Ages are a myth. One dangerous historical myth I've discussed on the channel before, check out my Enemy at the Gates video for more on this, is the idea of the Good War. The justified and heroic war. Think defeating the Nazis in World War II. The Allies did a lot of horrific stuff because it's literally impossible not to in a war of that scale. But that gets conveniently swept under the rug because the war overall is for a legitimate reason. It's a good idea to stop the Nazis. You'll note the horrific stuff our Cold War opponents did defeating the same enemy does not get conveniently forgotten. When politicians want to sell us on their hot new war, they will invoke historical wars that we are encouraged to remember as uncomplicatedly good and heroic. But they're not. War itself is an atrocity to be avoided at all costs. And in my lifetime, some incredibly unjustified and horrible wars have been started using our lack of historical curiosity as a tool to sell us on the idea that we could, for example, invade Iraq in a just and noble way. Look how that went. A population divorced from historical understanding is a population who can be convinced of anything. Why do you think our political commentators seem dead set on not remembering anything past the last four or five year election cycle? Don't be a goldfish, have a stubbornly good memory, and don't let the bastards take history from you. It's not just the study of everything that's ever happened in human society, it's the study of why. And we need it, or we'll believe anything the powerful tell us next time they want us to die for oil, or arms manufacturers, or just to make sure our bosses aren't losing profits on account of a global pandemic. History belongs to us. Mm -hmm.